Hello, my dear friends and loved ones. Thanks for tuning in today to watch this moment of exhortation. Let's share with the prayer. Mighty and everlasting Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you, Father, even as we are about to hear your word. I pray that we shall not leave here the same, but we shall leave here blessed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Like we always do, I want us to start with um, a moment of praise and worship and for that, I would like to invite our sister Gladys to lead us in this time of worship. Jehovah is your name. Last week, we started looking at lessons from the church in Smyrna. We are looking at past questions that we can use to prepare ourselves when we get to heaven. I started by asking that, I mean, if it's ever crossed your mind that what would Jesus tell you if he ever met you, then the good news is that what he's likely to tell you, he told one of these seven churches that he addressed in the book of Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3. We've already looked at the church of Ephesus and we are now in the church of Smyrna. So I want us to read what he said to the church of Smyrna and then we move forward. So Revelation chapter 2 verse 8, he says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Hallelujah. So the church of Ismena 
was one of two churches that had no fault. They had no problem, they were on course, you know. And um, this church was a church that also happened to be poor. Jesus actually said, I know thy poverty, however you are rich. So I did mention last week that don't use money as a measure of God's approval. Don't use money as a measure of God's approval. It is also very likely that this church was also a small church because having been in ministry for 20 years, I can tell you that attendance is almost directly proportional to income. Rarely do you have a small church with a large income. You know, it does happen. You can have some one million name there. But generally speaking, attendance is always equal to, it's always directly proportional to income or income is always directly proportional to attendance the more people you have the more money you are likely to have so for this church to be poor it's likely that there ain't that many people so if you are watching me don't use size to determine god's approval the fact that a church may be big huge has a large whatever doesn't mean that what is going there is is going on there is absolutely right we'll see that when we get to the church of Sardis, because they had a name that you know that they were alive but they were actually dead it was a famous church but that was the church that Jesus described as totally dead hallelujah mm -hmm. now something very important we need to learn about the church is manner is the fact that Jesus said the pastor had the people who said they were Jews Jews are children of God and yet they lied because they were actually the synagogue of Satan let me read that to you again in verse number nine it says i know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich and i know the blasphemy of them which say they are jews and are not but are the synagogue of satan this was this was a big one for me because i've read the story or this passage many times but it had never occurred to me that he actually said they are the synagogue of satan not they are off no they are which means a person can become Satan. A person can actually become Satan. Hallelujah. Now, I ask myself, so what stages does a person go through to get to this unfortunate point where you are actually being described as the synagogue of Satan? How does a person become a synagogue of Satan? We need to find out so that two things, we can avoid becoming the synagogue of Satan ourselves, where Satan has inhabited us fully so that we are one with him. And then we should be able to know the stages so that we can identify it in people. When people are becoming the synagogue of Satan, we can say that, mm, this, is, this is the Satan that the Bible talks about. Hallelujah. So I identified three stages of becoming the synagogue of Satan. The first one is when you see a person who counters God's instructions to you. When you see somebody who opposes God's instructions to you. And the classic example we want to look at with this one is Peter. So let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to read from verse number... Um, Matthew 16 from verse... Uh, 16. It says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. 
thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So here was Peter, the head of the church that had received Jesus' endorsement because God had used him mightily to reveal who Jesus was. You know, and three verses later, Jesus calls him Satan. And you notice why Jesus called him Satan because he, he, he was more interested in the things of men than the things of God. He opposed Jesus' convictions and instructions to go to the cross and die. Hallelujah. So when you see somebody who opposes what you know clearly, you believe clearly, you are convinced clearly about that God has spoken to you, the person may even be the head of the church, like Peter, but that's Satan. That's why Jesus said, the devil comes as an angel of light. Let me tell you, my dear friend, if you ever base your Christianity, your Christian faith, if you ever connect it to a man, you are, you are on the wrong, wrong track. You are making a mistake. Because that very man is the man that the devil can use to dissuade you from pleasing God. That very person. That is why I showed you Matthew 24, where Jesus, they asked Jesus, what shall be the end of the of, of, of time, the end of the world. What shall be the sign? Jesus said, be careful of deception. Beware that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. They will say, I am Christ. Like Peter. A classic example of that is Peter himself. They will say, I am Christ. They won't say, they are Christ. They will seem to be interested in saying the right things, but they will deceive many. So it's a mixture. Some truth and a lie, some truth and a lie. How do we keep this? No God for yourself. No God for yourself. Christianity was never planned to be a religion, a group thing. Christianity is 100% a relationship between you and God. Hallelujah. Peter was not there when God told Jesus, go and die on the cross. He had no right to advise Jesus. But just because of the pedigree he had and the endorsement he had received from Christ, he assumed, he presumed he could just oppose, and that was Satan using him. So when you see people who, you know, seem to be using reason to counter your convictions about the things of God, that is the first thing of somebody becoming Satan. That is Satan introducing them to become him. 100%. I tell people, if, you, if I'm your pastor and you want to silence me from making an input in your life, you are taking a decision, you want to keep me quiet from making an input in your life, just tell me God said. Because for me, when you say God said, that is where it ends. Because I am not God in your life. God is above all of us. As soon as you, God told me to marry this person, and I'm sure that you are sure God told you, that's where it ends. Even if I think you are making a bad decision, it's not my place anymore. If you say, oh, I'm not sure, but this is what I'm thinking, then I'll make an input. But when somebody says, God said, this is what I, I believe I should do, I do not think that a man should begin to stand in that person's way. Hallelujah. Because that is characteristic of Satan. Now, let me show you something. There are basically two types of wisdom. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of the devil. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of... These are the two types of wisdom that are there. But now, the wisdom of the devil manifests in three ways. In three ways. So, many people interpret the scripture I'm going to show you to say that there are four types of wisdom. There's actually two. The wisdom of God and then the wisdom of the devil. There is either light or darkness. It's as simple as that. Let's turn our Bible to James chapter 3. James 3, verse number 17. James all right so james chapter 3 verse 17 it says oh let's read from verse um, 14 so that we understand it says but if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not and lie not against the truth this wisdom descended not from above but is earthly sensual and devilish said this wisdom so it's a particular wisdom this wisdom, it is in these, this wisdom, which is the wisdom of the devil or the wisdom that is not the wisdom of God, is earthly, 
is sensual and is devilish. So it manifests in these three ways. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil way. Now 17. But the wisdom that is from above, so you see, the contrast of this wisdom, which is a particular wisdom, is the wisdom that is from above. So the wisdom that is not about from above is the wisdom of the devil. And this wisdom manifests in three ways. It's earthly, sensual, and devilish. That is why, even though what Peter seemed to, to say was just reasonable, just because it was earthly and it was from his senses, nobody, nobody wants somebody he loves to go and die. Nobody wants that. So it, it comes off as a good idea. Oh, why? Jesus, don't say such things. We need you to live. Whatever. Jesus says, Satan, thou savest not the things that be of God, but of men. Good ideas can be devilish ideas if they are not God's ideas. It's something nice to put on Facebook. Good ideas can be, in fact, not can be, are devilish ideas. If they are not God's ideas. So be very careful of good advice. What you are calling good advice. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So just by opposing. Don't let anybody oppose what you believe God is telling you. That's why you stand before God alone. Hallelujah. The next example I want us to look at is Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a type of, you know, the devil because he held God's people bound. Let's go to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So, yeah, there it is. Exodus 5. And we want to read... Uh, Verse number one. Let's read from verse one. It says, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. God has spoken to Moses. Go and tell Pharaoh, Let my people go. And then Pharaoh says, I know not the Lord, neither will I let the people go. When somebody is opposing what God has told you, it's because he doesn't know your God. He wasn't there when God spoke to you. He wasn't there when God spoke to you. That's what we are called Christians, like Christ. Like Christ. Sometimes I ask people, are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then they will mention a particular denomination they go to. I go to so and so. I'm that. I'm this, I'm that, I'm Anglican, I'm Presbyterian, I go to this church, I go to that church, I go to Catholic, I go to this, I go to this international whatever, you know. It's not a good thing. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Remember in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, the reason he said people will lose heaven was because he said, I never knew you. Matthew 7, 23. I never knew you. That is going to be the reason and the basis for which people will lose their, their salvation. Or for which, I mean for which, the reason for which people will not make it to heaven. Though they did great works. Hallelujah. Now the next one, example, I want us to look at is the example of uh, a young prophet and an old prophet in First, um, first Kings chapter 13. Quickly, First Kings 13. God told this young prophet, do not eat bread or drink water in Bethel. Don't refresh yourself. God sent him on an assignment. Then an old prophet, not necessarily maybe in age, but maybe old prophet, God used him once, then God is not using him again, came and used his pedigree to convince this young prophet against his conviction. And then what happened? He died. So, in First Corinthians thirteen, uh, First Kings, sorry, chapter thirteen. If you read verse uh, eleven, it says, "Now 
There dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the words that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also the, their father, and their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled them the ass, saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Are thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet. Also as thou art, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thy house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him, my God. The old prophet lied to the young prophet, my God. And somebody will say, don't take your conviction seriously. Be careful of ministries and men of God who become God in your life, who feel that God cannot speak to you outside of them. That is Satan. That is Satan. Then why did God give us the Holy Spirit? Then why did God give us the Holy Spirit? This is, we are looking at it. This guy lies and convinces this young prophet and when you continue, he goes to eat bread and whilst he's eating bread, now this same lying prophet, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he tells the guy, you have disobeyed God and you will die. And then this guy dies. This young prophet dies. Simply for not obeying God. Hallelujah. So my dear friend, I want to, I want to warn you with all due respect, be very careful of anybody who opposes what you believe to be God. That is the first stage of somebody on the way to becoming totally inhabited by Satan. Opposing people's convictions, opposing people's directives from the law. Then the second stage, which I'll just start and then we'll continue next week, is manipulation. When you find somebody manipulating you to get you to do what he wants. Manipulating you to get you to do what he wants. You know, some, the first thing is just a, 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 an ordinary counter. Oh, an, an alternative to what God told you clearly. The second thing is a notch higher. Manipulation. Now watch this. When in this story, the young prophet told the old prophet, no, this is what God has told me. Look at, look at the manipulation. Look at this. Uh, verse. Verse 18. No, not verse 18. Uh, good, 18, yes. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me. That's manipulation. You see, the person, the, this bastarding prophet is now using his pedigree. Oh, I am also a man of God. Am I not your father? Did I not give birth to you? Am I not the one who appointed you? So what? Is it equal to salvation? Does that make you God? Wives can manipulate husbands. Ahab committed himself to evil because of Jezebel. Oh, I'm preaching a good message. Be careful of Somebody now insisting, do this, trying hard to cook. I mean, let me give you a classic example of this, which is opposite to this. When the younger son, the younger son, a certain man had two sons, Luke 15, and the younger son decided to go to a far country, the father didn't even talk to him. The father allowed him to go, he gave him. You see, the point there is that a person has a right to make a mistake, even if what you, are, you think he's, he's doing is a mistake. He has a right to make a mistake. That's why the Bible says that we learn even by obedience. By, we learn obedience by what we suffer. So sometimes 
you have to suffer something. That is why when somebody wants to do something, you have to allow the person. It's the nature of God. It's the nature of God. But when you see somebody who insists and will not let you follow your convictions, even if he thinks it's wrong, it's wrong you are seeing Satan because it could be right. I'll continue on next week. Because it could be right. It could be right. And I tell you, well-meaning people can become vessels of Satan easily if you don't let people live their lives. Next week, I'll show, I will go into detail. I'll show you a classic example of Naomi and Naomi and Ruth and Opa. Ruth and Opa lost their husbands. Who happened to the sons of Naomi? They were following Naomi still. Naomi stands to them and says, Go, I do not have any more sons. Even if I whatever, 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 whatever. Then Opa followed. That was the end of Opa. We never heard about Opa again. Ruth was strong. She looked at Naomi and said, With all due respect, that's modern English. She said, And treat me not. You see? And there's all this, oh, you don't respect authority. Nonsense. Nonsense. Read your Bible. Ruth said, And treat me not to leave thee. Your God, the God you Naomi, you don't believe in him, he'll be my God. That's conviction. Your people that you left will be my people. Your God will be my God. When you die, I will die. When you are buried, she ended up marrying Boaz. They gave birth to Obed, who gave birth to Jesse. Jesse gave birth to David, Solomon. And through that line, Jesus was born. Naomi almost became a vessel of Satan to curtail the destiny of Ruth. Follow your conviction. Even if you are dealing with your child, give your child a chance to make a mistake. If he really believes this is what he should do. Don't be God in people's lives. Don't allow anybody to be God in your life. Hallelujah. That's why Paul asked the Galatians, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You remember? We'll look at that into details. Maybe we should just look at that. Galatians 3. Quickly, I'll end with that. Galatians chapter 3. Bewitchment. That is, that is witchcraft. Yeah. Galatians, Ephesians, also Galatians chapter 3. Yeah. Verse 1. All foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? That you should not obey the truth, the Holy Spirit, God, your convictions. Who has bewitched you? What people who control your life? Using manipulation, domination, intimidation, that's witchcraft. We'll go into details of this next week. Because the whole idea is to get you not to obey the truth. May you be delivered from it. Take your conviction seriously in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If God gave his life to you, his, if God gave his life for you, why would not God, God speak his word to you? Why would not God speak to you? Think about it. You, we only need men of God to guide us, not, not to become God in our lives. Don't allow it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I trust this has been a blessing to you. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Maybe you listen to this. It blessed you. You are there. You are not born again. You want to say, Bishop, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I accept I'm a sinner. I accept I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe Jesus died for me. And resurrected on the third day. And resurrected on the third day. I confess Jesus. I confess Jesus. As my Lord. As my Lord. And Savior. And Savior. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. For saving me. For saving me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's the first step towards salvation. You now need to be dipped in water for baptism to complete your salvation. Call the number on your screen. Send a WhatsApp. And then... I'll show you. If you can't find any serious Christian, go to the pool, riverside, and let the person dip you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then your salvation is complete. I'd like to encourage you to become a part of Penwell Christ Centre Church. Very soon, we are going to announce our physical location in Accra, and I trust that you will be blessed to join this family. Penwell Christ Centre Church, the place of God's face. Hallelujah. I want you to take out your tithes and your offering send an offering, pay your tithe, support us in the work that we are doing. And whilst we do that, I want to invite our sister Gladys to give us a ministration. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
for ministration. Before we go, lift your hands, let me bless you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Amen. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Amen. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May goodness and mercies follow you all the days of your life. May no weapon formed against you prosper. Every time that shall rise up against you, judgment will condemn. Amen. May you be above and never beneath. May the Lord send his angels to protect you from the arrow that fly by day, from the terror that operates at night, from the pestilence that walks in darkness, and the destruction that wasted at noonday in the mighty name of Jesus. Anything that will bring tears to your eyes, we curse it Amen. in Jesus' name. You shall live and not die to declare the works of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.